My name is Bob Soto. I live in Wisconsin. It's all good. Thanks for coming today. Thank you. I'm, I'm here to find out. Looking forward, you know this is a big event. Yeah. His right now uh, ability assembly. Good. To change the, uh, to amend the tarot, the tribal yes. amendment of the tarot. Right. How do you feel about that? Uh, I will, I'm very, very, very familiar about with, with this issue. I, I'm a I former <laughs> municipal employee, yeah. retiree. I, I, I will, uh, I will say that I'm not even going to come here. Um, I'd be lying to you if I told you that there was anything more than zero percent chance that that bill moves anywhere in any direction in the next three weeks. Um, folks in Albany are um, they're all in election mode. Uh, they all value their relationships on both sides of the aisle with uh, with the unions. Um, some want their support; others are scared. Um, having them oppose them. Uh, I would say what I've experienced on this particular issue is that you have a lot of people with the will to support reform, um, but are very well aware that um, if they put their neck out and their neck gets chopped off, and like everyone else who has the will to support reform, just ends up saying, oh, look at that idiot, and put his neck out there. Um, I think that the key is, I, I think strategically, um, what, I would, what I recommend on this particular issue, so we have a gubernatorial race right now, uh, Rob Astorino is in favor of uh, amending the, uh, the, the Taylor Law. Yeah. Um, he's going to inject that into the gubernatorial debate. Um, I think that when you have a debate where the two of them are standing there and a question is asked or they just, you know, Rob just engages the governor on it, uh, that you can possibly get some commitments um, on, all, on all sides. Uh, I really don't think without the governor who is uh, on board, um, just with the way these issues work, the players, not, not the legislators, but the, from, the, from the unions, um, the way that they leverage relationships and power and money, um, I think it's critically important, strategically, that while I'm telling you nothing's going to happen the next three weeks, that when you switch into campaign mode, um, that the gubernatorial race ends up resulting in a commitment for reform in 2015. Um, and then, I mean, I'm, I'm this, in the legislature, I've seen it, I've had the conversations with people, I know where they stand. Um, you know, the support is there. Uh, no way without a governor who's willing to put his neck out at all. Uh, but I think it's good that. What's a, what's an alternative to it? I mean, if it does get done, how? I mean, what what do the uh, employees have uh, to fight back? It depends. With it? it depends what the it depends what the reform is. Yeah. I mean, so um, you know, some people advance. You know, they, you know, saying that we need to get rid of the tribal amendment. That's not what Rob advocates for. Rob advocates for changing it with regards to like step increases. Um, so it really depends on what the negotiations in the final form looks like. Um, so that I have no idea. If there was anything done, I do not know what that final agreement is. And again, strategically. You know, for those who are advocating for reform, it's all, uh, I think that, I mean, I think the, the key is in the gubernatorial race. Once you get past the politics of elections, and you move to governing once the session starts in 2015, then you're negotiating out uh, a solution, which can take a thousand different forms. Um, some are meaningless, and, you know, some are... You know, very complex and significant. Mm -hmm. So that I have no idea how to. Well, no, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, that's good or bad. I'll always answer every question as honestly as I can. Okay, thank you. Yay! Yay!
start with the Pledge of Allegiance to this great country. Oh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Just a moment for all the men and women that serve this great nation throughout the world to keep us free. Thank you so much. And I'd like to just add one other thing. Uh, Paul Borowski, who is the president of the Smithtown Republican Club, his father, uh, who served in World War II and was honored three months ago by the state of Texas because he served on the battleship Texas throughout the war. Just passed away last week. And at the age of 91, and just one of our great men who kept this country free between uh, 1941 and 1945. All, once again, Mayor Jack. Here, here. <laughs> I think we all know why we're here today. Every election that comes up forces voters to weigh the past against the future. And the future in the first, uh, first congressional district is a gentleman that has worked long and hard that has served this country, that has fought overseas, and has come back. And in 2008, when our current congressman did not have opposition, stepped forward and said, I will run. Because I don't like him, but because I disagree with his principles. And in a democracy, democracy means choice, and I'm going to give a choice. We're in a great race. He went on then to contest for the state senate. Talked about repealing the MPA payroll tax and some of the other things that the state has done to make us one of the least competitive states in the United States. And he's fought that battle in the state senate each and every day. And now, this year, he steps forward once again as our candidate for the United States Congress. Someone that's going to carry our message our concerns for Washington, someone that's going to speak for us, my good friend, someone that I am strongly supporting, Lee Zelda. time he was a county legislator, uh, where I learned uh, what it's like, really, to have very deep knowledge and passion for every corner of your business. Uh, everyone is very lucky and well represented. Now, having him as uh, the town supervisor here in Brookhaven, he's someone with an incredibly deep passion for service, which I uh, so very much respect. So, uh, so thank you, Ed, for everything that you do for our party and for our community. To, uh, to, to Bill Ellis, the, uh, the chairman of the, uh, the great town of Smithtown, uh, who now I, I, I'm not unable to travel in Smithtown without 
uh, the, the uh, I get these, the, this thing that people go V for Lee, and I guess it's started with Bill. Uh, and uh, I, I thank you to, uh, to, to the chairman for uh, getting his committee so engaged, the elected officials engaged, uh, in, a, in a town which is very conservative uh, and will be coming out to vote in this primary. So, uh, so thank you for what you're doing, uh, Chairman, in Spittown. <laughs> Now, I, I want to introduce a, a very good uh, friend of mine who is here. Uh, he is our very uh, special guest, uh, someone I've, I've known now for, for several years. And he has become a, a conservative voice for uh, our generation. Uh, he you know, started off, uh, actually he was up in Albany where I went to college and law school. Before that, he grew up in Belmore where uh, my father and stepmother who are here uh, they live just blocks away from uh, where Andrew grew up in Belmore, and uh, he is he comes from a, a very proud, patriotic, uh, pro-American, conservative family. And every day, whether he's on the radio, on Sirius XM, uh, on Channel 125, Patriot from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m., or every evening on The Blaze, for everyone uh, who has had the opportunity to, to watch this new channel, uh, that has been growing and growing. It's been this alternative, conservative voice to, uh, to, to what we see on Fox News. Uh, and he has his own show called Wilkow. Uh, so I would encourage all of you, if you haven't, either listened to him on the radio or watched him on TV to start. Uh, one of my favorite phrases, which he'll repeat every day, uh, and drive it home because it's so true. Uh, he says that we're right. And they're wrong, <laughs> and that's the end of the story. <laughs> I gotta start with something on my cell phone. I know what I'm gonna say. I texted Lee last night. This is no joke. This is on my cell phone, and I wrote, uh, "Tell me before tomorrow that you won't turn right up." <laughs> I won't turn rhino. <laughs> I, I, I texted back, okay, see you tomorrow. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, the funny thing is, Lee has a little known talent for assembling furniture. It was probably, I don't know, what year did you guys come out of July at my house? 2011? Like then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I had just refurbished my own patio with paving stones, and uh, I needed furniture for it. I wanted a fire pit, I wanted rocking chairs, so it was really good time. I came back and smoked a cigar, and Lee and his family were out there, and I'm running around setting up for my house faces a lake, and they do fireworks. So Lee and I go to the Home Depot, and I'm stressing over what to get. So just get this set. Just get it in building. And we sat there in the... In the 100 degree weather, literally on this paving stone patio, you know, emanating heat. Uh, and we're just sitting there with wrenches, and just two guys, like, with no experience building these stairs. We did that for I don't know how many hours. Two ladies come out and say, Oh, you ready now? Yes, I'm ready. We can all come out here and sit down now. Um, so I know Lee on many levels more than politics. I know him as a friend, I, I know his personal story, his, his wife and daughter have stayed at my house. Uh, so. This is really easy. Um, the hard part is getting people to understand that we have moved past Republican and Democrat. And this is something I've been focusing a lot on on television and radio. That's the plug. If you haven't seen it, please watch it. Um, I don't know what channel is on Cablevision here. I am um, we are being corralled into the mass. That sounds conspiratorial, but if you, if you think about it, everything this government is doing is moving us more and more into a nameless, faceless mass of humanity. And I pondered the question the other day on radio and television, I think I shocked some people. We don't take calls on TV, we do on radio. If I asked you a year or two ago, five years ago, who is the beneficiary in the relationship between the population and the elites. What would you say? Just answer quietly. You probably think, well, 
Well, they created Social Security. And they created Medicare. And there are all these things like public schools that we get from these really smart people in Washington, D.C. If you, if you really were to go out and, and ask the average pedestrian this question, they would probably almost seem thankful to some of these government programs until you remind them you pay for all exactly. this stuff. And everything the government screws up, it screws up on your dime. And everything they screw up, they demand to screw up more. They can't make Amtrak profitable. They want to put high speed rail everywhere. They can't make Medicare and Medicaid work, so they've gone to Obama. They can't even make the VA work. But think about that. The one hospital system that they're actually supposed to be running, not Medicare, not Medicaid, not Obamacare. They can't make that work. They didn't fix it. They just moved on to something else. The truth is, the masses don't benefit from their relationship with the elite. He think it's better. You think it's better to be receiving Social Security or distributing it? <laughs> you think it's better to be uh, in a public school or writing the curriculum? You think it's better to be on food stamps or <coughs> distributing the food stamps? Obviously, Washington is the place to be. And we've created this notion, and I have a very high respect for people who attend Ivy League institutions in applied science, medicine, physics, chemistry, the kind of things where there's absolutes and you have to have experience. Some of the more um, gray area subjects, like political science, I have a hard time believing that these people are so endowed with intellect and ability that we have to have a handful of people from a handful of institutions running our lives from the day we're born to the day we die. But again, if you ask most people, hey, Barack Obama went to Harvard. So did George Bush. And you noticed that a lot of the really bad ideas for government come from a handful of people from a handful of institutions. And something that goes even further, if you look at the people who run the EPA, people who run the USDA, people that run um, this new consumer financial bureau, they're all people that come from these elite institutions who couldn't cut day one in the private sector. If you're so smart and you've got such great ideas, then invent the next cell phone or something. It's amazing. I couldn't cut it the stock market, so I'm going to go to the city, I'm going to go to the FDA <coughs> or the SEC. I couldn't cut it in agriculture, so I'm going to go to the USDA. I couldn't wherever I couldn't cut it. That's where I want to be regulated. Between that group of people and the attitude that we're supposed to be thankful for all the wonderful things they've done to us, it's no wonder why. It's almost impossible to get rid of some of these people in Washington, and it's almost impossible to really get people to understand that I don't care if they're a Republican or a Democrat. We've been through this thing that somehow your bridge to nowhere is okay because you've got an R next to your name, but that guy's bridge to nowhere is horrible because he's got a thing next to his name. It costs the same amount of money. So we need people like Lee who understand that the government was designed to do certain things. It was. We're not. I love when they say, you guys are anarchists. Anarchists. Believe in the Constitution. That's a government, government document. It's government. Rightful, respectful, limited, constitutional government the way it was designed. If you notice, for the past hundred years, we haven't had that. Mm -hmm. my, my friend Mark Levin said um, not too long ago, and I, I didn't even think of this. He said, if you're under 30, you've never been able to vote for a conservative president. Think about that. Me, myself, my friend Wayne is over here. We went to high school and college together. Um, we've never had a chance to vote for a solid conservative. The first time we were able to vote was 1992. You know how that went. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I was, I was kind of a Ross Perot guy. Um, 96. 2000, eh. 2004. Eh. So we need real intellectual conservatives who understand it's not that we reject government or we reject um, leadership or intellect or education. We reject people who think it's their job to treat us like nameless, faceless people. We're not the masses. 
We're not Venezuela. Who wants to live in Venezuela? Who wants to live in Cuba? I don't. I don't want to live in China. You don't want to live in China. But we have we have turned our population, and now we have common core population. I mean, if you want to talk about mind control, you want to talk about dumbing down the population and making them worship at the altar of government, that's common core. Um, and that frightens me. My, my daughter uh, is four and a half. She started kindergarten about a year, two months ago. And my wife and I are pregnant by what they're going to do. Whereas if you ask most people, hey, how are the schools around here? Oh, they're great. Here's what? If the government monopolizes things and there's no competition, how do you know something's the best? How, how, how could you possibly know that? How could you possibly know that what the government is delivering is the best? And what is the recourse when government fails? There isn't one. I'll, I'll wrap with this. I don't want to take too much of your time. Oh, I also have to get back to my daughter's dance. My, my daughter's first dance recital today. If I don't get home by three, I'm a dead man. Uh, I have a four and a half year old in a fairy costume that's really uh, More of your property, what you could do is you incite them away from you and into the government. And if you look at how Social Security works, you pay in. But if you pass away, you and your spouse pass away, and your children have reached the age of majority. Where does that money go? It the government. It's not your private property anymore. You earned it. It was put in an account with your name on it. But then it just gets diluted into government. If you can't leave that behind. That sort of removal of what we produce belonging to us is going away ever more. Ever more into government through Obamacare. You're looking at single payer. I don't care what anybody says. You're looking at single payer. They are one step from single payers. And what that means, and I'm sure you know what it means, but on a more, uh, lack of a better word, intellectual level, you are going to pay into the system. Then the system's going to decide what you're worth. That's what it's going to This has nothing to do with 47 million people with without insurance. You easily could have applied for Congress Spark and let insurance work like I said. And that's another one. If government runs everything so much better, say this to young people, let them run iTunes. Let them run iTunes. If the government runs everything better, let them run iTunes. Most people under 30 would reject that. Why? Why? If you don't trust the government to pick your playlist, why would you let them run your <laughs> <laughs> about what songs are going to be available, what they're going to cost, how many you can download, you know, who gets to make all, all these things that are, we all love music in some way, but you know, life is trivial. If you don't want the government making trivial decisions, how could you want them making life and death decisions? But the system that they're setting up is turning into the public education system. If you've got one child or two children in the public schools, you don't pay per head for those kids. So if your neighbor's got four kids and you've got two, well then you're essentially sharing the education of six children. That means your neighbor or somebody in your community doesn't have to think about the cost of raising your child. The system is just there. I don't have to think about the cost of going to the doctor. The system is just there. Well, it's not just there. Nothing is free. But when you realize the more you contribute, the less you get, what is the point of doing anything. And I thought we left that nonsensical notion to other countries. And, uh, okay, I lied, I'm gonna wrap up this one. Um, <laughs> I don't know if any of you have been following Venezuela. I follow it to its extreme because it is the clearest, most modern example of a nation with no reason to collapse, to collapse. You're talking about a nation with a vibrant agriculture vibrant interior, vibrant coastline, vibrant energy sector, the richest oil reserves in the country, they're importing oil now. So they can't even get it out of the ground. Fifteen years ago, Hugo Chavez was elected president of Venezuela. Fifteen years later, people are waiting on three or four hour lines for a, a government allotment of a bag of beans and rice. How does that happen? The 
because they promised everything. They promised free health care, free education. They promised housing. Have you seen those ugly, gray, cinder block buildings that they're tearing down around? I know it's Brazil, but it's the same style for, for the World Cup. They promised things to the people. And then as they run out of things to give away, they seize more things. And as they seize more things, people produce less things. You can't just show up and say, this cattle ranch belongs to the people. <coughs> and think you're going to get the same output of beef. You can't show up and say, this oil rig belongs to the people. And that's what they did. And that is exactly what we're doing right now. And we're doing it under different branding, with a big smile, with red, white, and blue balloons, and conferences on why the kids need these general standards, and why everyone needs to have access to this health care, and all this stuff. If we don't put people in Congress who are not saying to themselves, yeah, I kind of reject it, but now i got to figure out how to think. How do I bet it? Well, I guess if I'm a establishment Republican member of Congress, I can soften my view if I get some insurance companies to make a few donations to my campaign. If we are allocating risk order money, which is going to their bank accounts, why not have some of it come my way? That's the problem with the establishment. That's what they do. They, on the surface, reject these things. But then, as soon as we look away from them and think that they're really in there combating these things, we start to soften up a little bit. Like Mitch McConnell said, well, you know, it's really difficult to get rid of common people. You can't fix bad progressive ideas by just electing somebody who aren't it going to do. You need people with principle who understand the problems of government and are willing to say, you know what, we are going to vote against this stuff. And then you know what, we're going to get rid of it. And we're like, why did sector do it? Because that's the way it was supposed to be. With that, I'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> no more points to the live stage. Sirius XM, um, at the time that I was getting 
to that moment where I had hit the next set, the terrestrial lineup in 2006 was really kind of locked up. I mean, you had nine teams running back to Laura Ingram, you had three about Limbaugh, you had six about Fanny, six nine, you had Levine and Savage, and then sort of late nights and, and early mornings are really most of the morning drive is news traffic, weather, sports, that sort of thing. So along came Sirius <coughs> XM, Sirius Time, and then XM Fox News. And I just thought, well, this company has a few million subscribers. It's kind of like a big city that's growing. I, I guess I got a blue one on planting. I took a chance on Sirius XM, which is now in, you've got every car rolling up the center line with 25 million subscribers. So it's pretty easy to find now. And it's a channel here on 157 on cable vision. So, one is 5 p.m. on Cattle Show Warners, which is 5 p.m. is on 6 p.m. and now I'm on 7 p.m. Anyone? Anyone? I have a question. You can ask him too, you know. I know. But <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, when you said he's not going to be final, he's okay. All right, one question. I get so frustrated when Republicans and the Democrats are the same. How do we educate the American people? Economics is, they call it the dismal science for a reason. Because it, the fallacies of, of economics are so easy and tempting to fall for that there's this big pot of money in Washington, D.C., and somewhere in there is a chunk of it for you is, is impossible to get somebody to rep people, I mean, when they hear Social Security is popular, partly because Republicans, by and large, refuse to even discuss why it doesn't work, essentially. And I just gave you a tidbit. And then they'll say, well, um, we'll just manage it. Because they haven't really sat down and thought of a way out. I'll throw you one. If you wanted to get rid of Social Security, you wanted to get rid of it in a bloodless way, all the people who are on it have to be on it. You can't take back the contract. All the people who haven't gone on it, why do they have to pay you? Why must they? What's, 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 they keep acting like if people don't pay into Social Security, there's nothing out there in the private sector to plan for your retirement. And the people in the world should just get their money back in tax credits, prorated tax credits. Very simple. These are simple things. But once you mention Social Security and you say, look, on an on a economic level, it's a loser. You put money in when you're 20, by the time you're 60 after inflation, you're getting less out of that. Even if you put in a passbook, you would have made more money. Regular savings account at 1%. It's very difficult. Um, it, it, this, for talk radio, look, I, a lot of times I'm talking to the choir. I am really <coughs> preaching under the choir here. So many people are, quite frankly, bored. Because there's no 30-second solution. To these, to these questions, and yet promising more. Free ice cream on Thursdays for everyone is the way to go. But if the Democrats are promising two free scoops, the Republicans lose when they say, we want to be rational, we're just going to have one free scoop. Well, that guy's offering two free scoops. You lose. Sir in the back, raising your hand. <clears throat> it's very difficult to hear you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're losing about 40% of your audience. <laughs> I can be louder. And that's great. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, I just want to also tell you that you can sign up for the Blaze online. And oh, I think thanks. you can come to the Blaze for the here, so you don't have to pay for extra for the table. Well, it's a silver pack. You have a silver pack. And you can sign on that, too. Mm -hmm. so, We're well, right next to another thing that we're called Fusion. You know, just which IRS. <laughs> I mean, I, I can assure you that when I wake up in the morning, I don't get a phone call from the talk radio bureau. <laughs> you guys are going to talk about these, you know, five things. Obviously, what's in the news, what is on social media, what people are talking about, and then looking for perspective on, I won't lie to you, Drudge drives a lot of that. Um, in my case, Venezuela, each one of us has something 
that appeals to them. Uh, Delenn is very much um, about prosecution faith and who's right to pick up on that. I have picked up on Venezuela. That is sort of my cause celebrated because I don't think in modern times we've seen a nation collapse. Um, we each have our own issues, but there are things that everybody's talking about. And if you're not talking about those things, people may go look for someone who is. So if you're doing ESPN after the drive for the Yankee game, if you're just talking about the surfing championship in California, you're probably not going to get an audience. So, no problem. <coughs> Which is the bar which is the barrios, by the way, of black American countries. Well, they're happening here. Yeah. In, in Suffolk County. So I don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit. No, just it, it, again, these promises. Um, government was not here to house you, clothe you, feed you, raise your kids. If if you are letting government do the essential functions of an adult then what are you? That's why I keep saying nameless, faceless, mass of humanity. You're, you're a child. You're a ward of the state. You're a, you're a number on a spreadsheet someplace for another nameless, faceless person who doesn't give a damn about you to regulate. That's all that you are. All right, you can have the red one or the blue one. Well, what we do, it's the same thing. You can go to the crappy public school on the east side of town or on the west side of town. That's not choice. Choice is where you actually choose between two, three, five things and the other two, three, or four things don't get your business. That's what a choice is. And if, you know, a choice is not between two candidates <coughs> or, or two parties. It's between, a, a, for a lame word, cornucopia of things. But as, as long as people think, well, Walmart's open, I got choices to make. No, 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 no. That's, that's not making choices. Again, it's still the red and the blue. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
before you finish, Lee, would you identify the people in your office that we would probably get when we give you a call? Yeah, thank you. So, great question. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know if you heard, there's a uh, primary coming up. <laughs> uh, Tuesday, June 24th, and we have a, a great shot of winning this race. It requires uh, every possible Republican we know in the 1st Congressional District to actually show up and vote. And uh, there are too many times uh, that actually... Uh, yes. Right. Just in case I wasn't clear, if you were talking to any Republicans, I would ask for you to encourage them to vote for us. <laughs> yes, and if anyone can't be here, it's a tough week. There are a lot of people who are away. They can vote by absentee. And uh, Michael Lagercio was running for town council last year here in Brookhaven Town. And he lost by what, three votes? He lost by two votes. And, and he can literally count the, the family, friends, uh, the people in the in, in inner, inner circle who just didn't show up and vote that day. <coughs> And this is an election that requires everyone to come out and vote. Um, so we have some people here. Uh, where, Belinda, John, Barbara. Uh, raise your hand, Belinda, John, Barbara. Uh, uh, Robert uh, Fiore is, back, is in the back. Uh, there's, uh, on your way out, I would actually ask to, uh, to, to the request that was just made. Uh, they'll be at the check-in counter. Um, we have offices in Center Reach, Center Riches, Riverhead, and Smithtown. Uh, we are out knocking on doors every day. We're making calls every day. People writing letters to the editor, showing up at events, hosting meet and greets. Uh, there are many different ways to, uh, to get involved in the campaign. And I would ask all of you to please, uh, over the course of these next three and a half weeks, do everything in your power to help get out our message. Now, uh, Andrew has been... Uh, uh, it was, it was great. You actually brought me on the show a couple weeks ago. Aren't you booked tomorrow? Um, I, you know, actually, I was texting with Chelsea. I'm not sure yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> Andrew brought me on the show a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about the, uh, the irony that we are in a, Calif uh, we are in a uh, Republican primary here on the east end of Long Island, and the Republican primary against us is being completely funded by millions of dollars uh, from California Democrats. And, and the stuff that people are seeing on TV by our opponent is 100% untrue. They're not saying it because it's true. They're saying it because it pulls Wait, well. you didn't vote for Obamacare? I did not vote for Obamacare. <laughs> <laughs> I did never vote for Obamacare in any way, shape, or form. I heard you voted for Obamacare. <laughs> <laughs> I never voted for Obamacare. You had all those taxes, too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, it, and, if, and if there was some way for Andrew and I to have made that exchange in front of uh, 10,000 households in the 1st Congressional District, we'd be in good shape, but we can't. Uh, I'll try and knock on as many doors uh, as possible. Uh, we spread the word however we can, but it really requires all of you, with your friends, your people at work, uh, to, to set the record straight. And you can convert them. And what I've experienced is that it might be a, uh, you know, a, a, a nice uh, woman. She might be 90 years old. Uh, she's dressed well, classy asking me, is it true that you uh, voted for Obamacare? And I say no. And then she flips. And this nice woman then starts going off on, uh, on our opponent. It's not the first thing that they say. The first thing is asking, is it true? And then when we say no, uh, these people do not want to vote for our uh, opponent. He is not saying vote for me. He's saying don't vote for the other guy. We're saying vote for us. Uh, we're going to continue to do that over the course of the next three weeks. Uh, thank you all for your support, your generosity, for being here, for donating, for taking time uh, away from, from family and other activities. Uh, I head to Smithtown Day from here. Uh, we have a meet and greet in Center Reach in a few hours, so we're a busy campaign. Uh, I would ask you, know, so my team will be at the uh, at the front. If you can sign up to volunteer for any of our offices, and thank you again to uh, to Andrew. Publishers finally.
Hold in there, actually. I wonder, I wonder if it, you know, I, I was gonna, I felt like getting up and saying something, but I, I didn't think it was a good idea. No, because honestly, 